I'm going to take another look at the passage, but um, one of the things that I want to let you all know is that whenever we are given the assignment, and today's assignment, uh, in fact, Sonia's saying it's a wonderful message. I want you to know that, Mara. Yeah. So, um, so whenever we are charged to give a particular message, we always want to make sure that we have considered everything around the passages mm -hmm. because there's a reason why James said what he said in chapter 1, 19 through 20. Um, and for me, it's always um, important to understand how the writer got there. And when I understand how the writer got there, and I look at the historical account of everything that was going on, um, then it helps me to better understand what things mean in the context. So I can't start this without, first of all, saying that basically the whole book of James is the new covenant version of Proverbs. Proverbs and James are both practical books. And they are practical books that encourage us how to live righteously. Something this world today really needs a, a refresher course on. How to live righteously in this world. This world, as we know it, is full of temptation, full of trials, full of confusion, full of evil. And yet, we who are the ecclesia, the church, not the building guys, but the church, since I know Sonia's here, Sonia, you are a building block in this uh, spiritual church that God has put in place, not made by brick or mortar, but made by flesh and spirit and soul so that when we connect one with another the assembling of these bodies become the church and with that church it doesn't matter what location you're in it doesn't matter what building you're in or what you call that building the exciting thing is when, you know, one or more or many are gathered and all in his name. That is church. It's not based upon an order of service. It's not based upon even the spoken word. It is the conglomeration and the uh, fellowship of like-minded people. This is what separates the true believer from those that put on a mask of being Christian, yet they really deny the true holy power that's within God's word. And I, I had to say that up front because when we're dealing with the book of James, understand this, James, this James, because there are many Jameses in the Bible, but this James is the half-brother of Jesus himself. This same James, at one point in his life, denied who Jesus really was. And like all of us, had to come into the understanding that this was not just a mere man. But in fact, this is the one who was foretold, the one who was promised, you know, and here he is. And in James's case, this is someone 
who's living in my household. Now we say the half brother because we know that Jesus' father is God himself. But uh, uh, James' father is Joseph, truly Joseph. And so, you know, we have to take all of these things into account because one of the hardest things to acknowledge we say it, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase the script, scripture but a prophet is not recognized in their own home so for James to get to this place to be able to write this book and we're dealing with just uh, ver uh, verses in chapter 1 but to, to write these things down, you have to understand the incredible transformation that had to take place in him. And as Myra had alluded to, eventually cost him his life. My question before we even get into the text is, is our faith, is our trust, is our resolve, is that Something that you would be willing to die for. Not that it's always required, but we still live in a day and time where the gospel is hated. And we are living in a time in which people are still losing their lives for the sake of the gospel. The question is, where are we in our faith. And I'm saying faith, and I'll say faith a lot, because the book of James, particularly chapter 1, is about faith. Now, many would argue, well, it talks a lot about the works that people do, and you know what? Absolutely correct. But what we fail to realize is that those works that James will talk about throughout the book are based upon where an individual is in his or her faith. So I'm going to, of course, focus on our two main verses, but I'm going to pop out other verses and make a few other comments about the whole book because it matters in why he said what he said in 19 and 20. So I'm going to start and I'm going to read right from verse 1 because it's important to understand exactly where the author is in the way that he's sharing this and who he's sharing this to. So it says James, I'm sorry, I'm reading from the Eastern Standard Version, and one of the reasons why I use the Eastern Standard Version is because it gets rid of the vowels and the, all, all the uh, King James language, and it puts it in a place where I think it's a little more understandable without compromising the true meaning in the verses. So most of the things that I read are from the English Standard Version. So again, starting in chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Another word for dispersion could be the uh, diaspora. We, that's the word we kind of use today, diaspora. Same thing. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave 
of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. See, before we can get to verses 19 and 20, we have to talk about what is happening here. And historically, this was an incredible time in the history of what we call the church because you had the crucifixion of Jesus. You had his resurrection. You had his ascension. You had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in uh, Acts chapter 2. And then with the Holy Spirit in full effect, then it was the charge of those who were under the influence of the Holy Spirit to then go into Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and the uttermost parts of the earth. And that command has not changed to this day. And so when we're talking about just this first part that we read, James was writing to believers who were scattered. They were scattered. It, it references the 12 tribes, but honestly, uh, it's really talking about of those 12 tribes. It is talking about the Jews who ended up believing in Christianity. This is very important because those people were under a lot of attack, a lot of pressure. Not like today. It was way worse. Believe me, because Christianity as a religion, and it's all right to say religion, as a religion was very new in the grand scheme of all the pagan worship that was going on in that time. And even Judaism had a, a, a long-standing foundation, but in comes this Christianity thing, and Christianity confounded the minds of many, and many would end up hating Christians, whether they were Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians, there was an attack. Jesus in Scripture tells us that you will be hated by the world, but they will never hate you as much as they hate him. And the reason why you're being hated on is because they really hate him. And anyone who is proclaiming him, Jesus, so that we don't get that confused, Jesus, anyone proclaiming him, the Christ, is going to always come under attack. Whether we're talking about in the time when James wrote these words, or we're talking about today, I believe it's February 4th, 2024, all you have to do, let me give you an example. If you say you believe in God, ah, that's easy because people can associate God as any deity that they want to associate it as. That's why you will find pagan worshipers saying, oh, your God and my God, they're similar. You know, they're, they're the same, but they're not the same. And the reason that they're not the same is all in this name. Jesus, why do you think every knee will bow in heaven and in earth and every tongue will also confess in heaven and earth that name? Sonia, I think you're still there. Sonia is that name. But it's not just saying that name. It is believing in the power that is associated with that name. You can go and say, 
Jesus all day long and it will have little effect. But when you marry that name to actually vocally say that name with your faith, and James is all about faith here. When you marry those two, then you see the awesomeness of your Christ literally working on your behalf. And then you don't have to fear. And then you don't have to be afraid any longer. Because let me just let you in on a secret. The world is not going to get better. But we can be better while we're in this world. We can temper ourselves. We can humble ourselves. We can praise more. We can pray more. We can live righteously in the pit of hell, which is what this world is becoming right before our eyes. And so forgive me for being this emotional about it, but this is the only way that I can actually approach the text to make it make sense to me. I have to literally put myself in these words. I was going to have Myra do a bunch of reading. I, I don't think I'm going to have time to do that because I'm really trying to speed things up a little bit. But let me just throw out some key things before we even get to the main verse. First of all, it, it lets you know that you're going to have trials. You're going to be tempted. You might as well understand that no one who is a follower of Jesus Christ can get away from it. We literally sign up, Sonia. We sign up to say, hey, here am I. Persecute me. That's what he says when he says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. You can't pick up his cross. You, I can't pick up Myra's cross. Sonia, I can't pick up your cross. But I can pick up my cross. The burden that I have had to shoulder. What we don't understand is that if we are take the initiative to pick up that cross, then we can understand that. Then Jesus pops in and says, Hey, um, I will be the I will carry the yoke, the yoke, the, the, the instrument of bondage. I will put that upon me. Like it says in Hebrews, you can unload every sin and every weight that would so easily beset you and run this race with patience. Do you understand that that James might be saying it a different way, but it's all the same message and faith. What is faith? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, that sounds really fancy, but really what it means, Sonia, and anybody else who is listening right now, what it's really saying is you are trusting in the track record that God has already put in place. If he would do it then, why wouldn't he do it today? What makes you think that you're so special that God would deny you if you're operating in faith? It's almost arrogant to not have faith. Because faith is a substance of what we hope for. And God is all in on the things that we hope for when the things that we hope for are directed towards his kingdom. Understand that we start to want different things when we are in his influence. We're not looking at the cars and the houses and all of the riches that the world promises. We're looking at things that have more relevance, which I'll get into in a moment. These things are the things that solidify our faith. And once you have faith, like I'm going to give you a perfect example. Right now, we are sitting on my comfortable sofa. We are in my office. My wife gifted this office to me. And we are sitting on this sofa. Our faith, and I'll throw another word in, trust, is that the legs won't collapse while we're sitting here. 
The faith is, is that we have a foundation so that we don't get injured while we're sharing with you. Well, if we can have faith in wood and fabric, how much more faith do you need in order to trust and believe in Yahweh God who has invested everything into each and every one of us, particularly Jesus Christ. Oh, man. So, look, he says, if you lack wisdom, just ask God. In Matthew 7, 7, it epitomizes that, and ask, seek, knock. Y'all just go to Matthew 7. I'm trying to not have her flipping all these scriptures that I have down. But Matthew 7, 7 is just an understanding that God is the one who we can ask. And wisdom will be what he will give us in return. Myra mentioned Solomon. And Solomon, yes, made mistakes. But Solomon was also gifted with wisdom, but only when he married wisdom with faith did he come to the understanding that God is way superior. Who can know him? All you have to know is that God is able to do everything that he's proclaimed that he can do in the Holy Word. As we go on in James chapter 1, it talks about riches, uh, verses 9 through uh, 11. I'm not going to read all of that, but what it's basically saying is, where are you, and I'm making this personal to whoever's listening, where are you in what you believe Riches really are. Now, I know Sonia's there, and I won't put her business out there, but I will say this, because I've talked to her directly, there have been many things that have tried her patience that could have made her stand on the side of the road and quit, but there's something that was within her, hey Janae, something that was within her that compelled her to stay the course. The road can get rugged sometimes. The road ain't easy. But the payoff is incredible. If we would just stand still and see the salvation of our Lord. And what he's saying in the verses is that stop putting your confidence in the riches that this world can provide you. Those riches can be taken away as easily as they're given. Those riches will not keep you warm at night. Those riches will not provide you with the real comfort of peace that we all need, and yes, Sonia, we must trust in him. If you trust in him, the riches that he promises are eternal. They go beyond this world. What is money to God? What is a new car to God? What are new clothes to God? What is a new job to God? We keep calling these things blessings, and we really deny the true blessing, the one blessing that all of us get a chance to partake in, which is the blessing of Jesus Christ, who gave us the opportunity to be in eternity, to reconcile that which was lost into something that is found, where we can literally be with our Father in heaven face to face forever without the trials and temptations, without the sicknesses and diseases, without all of the anger and the anxiety and the stress. We can literally live that life, not just eternally, 
but you can actually live that today in this human flesh. And that is what James is trying to let us know. We don't have to wait and go up yonder to be with the Lord in order to experience heaven right here on earth in the midst of confusion. We become the peacemakers that's in the Beatitudes in Matthew. We become the epitome of everything that God is talking about through James by the obedience and the faith in which we live our lives. This is so critical. I'm sorry, guys. You're not going to hear these things this way in many of the houses of worship because the houses of worship are too focused on what's going on in this world and they're not focusing on Jesus. Hey, Ray Rose, I'm glad you're here right now because Ray Rose is a friend of mine and I know that he's been on this battlefield for the Lord. So when James is dealing with the issues of this world, he is letting us know that God, God himself, will allow us to go through these trials, these challenges. But don't give up because that same God is just saying to you, baby, I know you got this because I have equipped you with everything you really need according to my riches and glory. That has nothing to do with physical possessions. That has everything to do with where you are in your faith. And I get excited about this because this is what separates a, a, a mediocre Christian who's not operating in the full power of the Lord to one who understands that there's nothing that this world can do to shut you down unless you shut yourself down. And I'm going to tell you because in verses 12, what is that? Verses 12 through uh, maybe uh, 15. Let me read this for you real quick. It says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. In other words, if you can just keep your calm while everything is falling apart, you're going to be all right. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, and this is key. I want y'all to jot this down. This is verse 13 of chapter 1. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. Don't you let that fall out of your mouth. Because it says here, for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. Get it? No one. He doesn't do it. Okay? But each person, this is key as well, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Guys, let me tell you, I won't even say the devil made me do it. No, 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 no. My own desires is what puts me into the pit, which puts me into temptation. My desires, and I know this as a fact in those days that I lived off the chain, it wasn't anybody but me because I wanted to have all the bad stuff of this world, and I wanted it now. And that is my issue, not Satan's and definitely not God's. It is my heart that's on display here. It's my heart that has to accept what uh, I have done in order to separate myself from my creator. My guilt. If we could own our guilt, it would make things a lot easier because then God can get us on the path of righteousness and then we can tell our stories 
You want to know why I tell my story all the time? It's because I am not ashamed of it. I lived a bad life, Janae. I have been off. I have lived outside of God's will. But, you know, that was my prior life. But today, I now live for him. And in him is all of the power that I will ever need. And that same power that is vested within me through him, because it's not mine, but it's also yours, Janae. It's also yours, Sonia. Ray Rose, if you're still there, it's yours too. And then we can say that each person is tempted by uh, uh, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. It's like a, it's like a, 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 a bad situation with a pregnancy. Okay? It gives sin, uh, birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, brings forth death. Man, okay, so James is trying to get those Jewish Christians that are scattered all over the uh, diaspora to understand life is hard. Mm. It's going to be hard. They're going to hate you. But hang in there and do not let selfishness sneak its ugly head in. Do not let doubt sneak its ugly head in. They are the vipers that Myra was talking about. Those are the things that are set up to eliminate you. And a viper don't mind dying if he takes you with it. Now y'all got to recognize there's power in these words. And I, I'm going to, to jot down to... First of all, understanding in verse 16 that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. And I love how God references himself. He doesn't say creator. He specifically says to us, the father of lights. Because where there is light, Sonia, Janae, there cannot be the darkness of doubt, the darkness of hatred and envy and strife and, and maliciousness and anger and conceit. Every negative word you can come up with, it cannot survive where there is light. And God is saying here, Yahweh God is saying, I am the light, and I've given you the light on earth through Jesus, not the sun, not the S-U-N, but the light of Jesus Christ. And then he gives us the promise that that light can also be in us through him. And with that light, Wherever we go, Sonia, we eliminate darkness just by our presence. Y'all better walk in this anointed state that God, Yahweh, has set up for you. Now, in verse 18, and we're getting to the core, it says, and this is important, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Guys, and let me tell you, when I read that, what it really means to just simplify everything is that after God created all of the things that he put in this earth, he's looking at us, sinful us, still as his very best. The ones that he wants to take care of more than anything else. He is still loving us, y'all. We might be jacked up, 
But God is the one who's just saying, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and ye shall find my rest. That is what he's saying to us. Or we can go easy, John 3, 16, because he has given us Jesus Christ, his beloved son, his uh, uh, begotten son, that whosoever will simply believe will not perish, but have everlasting life. He did not come, at 17, he did not come into this world to condemn us, but that through him we, here's his word, might be saved. The choice is still ours. Jesus is there for anyone who's willing to accept him. But also remember, he's the one who chooses us. And so, now we get to the core of what Kristen started here, verses 19 through 20. It says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Oh man, I did, I did a deep dive into this. And so, Myra, I think I am going to put you to work before we close out. And hey, welcome, Philip. God bless you. So what uh, I'm going to have Myra do, and hopefully we can do a quick uh, flip through the Bible. So I'm going to break just 19 and 20 out. Um, starting at the first part of 19, it says, Know this, my beloved brothers. And I want you to go, uh, darling, to 1 John 2, 21. Know this, my beloved brothers. And as she turns there, there's a reason why I'm breaking this all out. Because you will find out that verses 19, actually I'm reading 19 through 21. Um, they actually mean so much more when you put it into the context of what we've already dealt with from verse 1 to verse 18, and even the verses after from uh, 22 to the end, to 27. You with me? Can you read that for us? Uh, verse 21. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. And that is the same sentiment that is being found here in James at the very beginning of verse 19, he is saying this. He is, because he's using beloved brothers, and we know that he's writing this to the Jewish Christians that have scattered uh, throughout the diaspora or the dispersion, as the, um, uh, the scriptures, the King James would say. These things are so important because he's writing as a, a, a point of encouragement, not as a point of saying you don't understand. All right, then in the second part of verse 19, he says, let every person be quick to hear. Can you go to Proverbs uh, 10, 19? And I might help you with some of these too. Proverbs 10, 19, let every person be quick to hear. Proverbs 10, 19. 10, 19. 10, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Proverbs, yeah, 10, 19, yes. Okay, I got it. 
In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. All right. Again, giving you, because I don't want y'all to just think that, you know, we're not lining up the scriptures. So this is just as a confirmation that God doesn't change. And even though he might use different writers, it's the same thing. All right. So then he says, slow to anger. Just go to Proverbs 14, verse 29. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalted folly. Amen. Amen. Then in verse 20, it says, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Can you get to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 and 2? All right, all right. We're just going to blow through this now. Uh, then in verse 21, it says, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Can you go to um, Colossians 3.8? But now we also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Mm. Amen. All right. All right, and then the second part of uh, verse 21 is, And receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. If you can go to uh, James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued, endued with knowledge among you? Let him shew how out of a good conversation his words with meekness of wisdom. Amen. Amen. All right, so with that said, I am going to um, uh, cover very briefly um, the, the remaining chapter uh, and then kind of go back to 1920 real quick. But basically in verses 22 through 25 it talks about the fact that faith is what produces these good works I won't read all of that for time's sake but this is look the problem with the institutionalized church is that the institutionalized church puts all the value on works and doing things, but they don't focus on faith. And in James, he's flipping that script and saying, there are no works to be done without the faith. Everything starts with the faith. When this beautiful gift that we get of salvation that we read about in Ephesians 2, uh, 8 and 9, this gift of, of salvation, it is by faith alone that we accept that this invisible God has actually gifted us in a way that will totally transform our lives and will allow us to be able to live eternally in his kingdom and not in the kingdom of hell. And that is basically the thrust of verses 22 through 25. And lastly, 26 and 27 deals with the importance of loving those in need in the process. And I do want to read these. 
and I have a, a, a little commentary, and then I promise you, I'm out. It says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Hey, Kelly Nelson, God bless you. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I couldn't leave without that one. And I'm going to make this real brief commentary because i got to go there. It doesn't relate all the way to verses 19 and 20, but it's so important to understand this because... I looked up all of the passages that I could find that mentioned anything about widows and orphans. And I'm going to say this. Um, one of the reasons why in Malachi, Malachi 3, that, that, that whole uh, uh, chapter that all the ministers run to when they're trying to get money out of you and you know and they talk about the storehouse well guys the storehouse of that day was a, a room or a chamber where food was stored in case of famine or to distribute, to guess what, to the widows and orphans. And when you see widows and orphans, they are how God the Father re uh, really recognizes those who are poor and in need. Okay, so whenever you see orphans and widows, know that it's, it's a, 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 a grander way of saying to those who are poverty stricken and cannot make a way for themselves. One of the reasons why Myra and I have dedicated our lives to the purposes of addressing widows and orphans. She deals with widows. She's dealt with some orphans. I definitely deal with orphans and I would imagine some widows too, especially in Baltimore. Okay, in any event, we dedicated our lives to the, uh, the provision of the poor. Not just in food, but in spirit as well. As long as we keep ourselves undefiled and focus on those in need. Where they say, everything going to be all right. Now, how does this all go back to the key verses that Kristen talked about in 19 and 20 as I, I get ready to close this? In order for any of this to make sense, we have to be quick to hear. Most of us are so ready to out-talk God we don't take enough time to listen. Even in our prayers, we speed through it and say amen, and we're gone. And have never really given God a chance to respond. But he says here to be quick to hear and slow to speak. And I, I confess before at least five people that I know that are viewing us right now, I confess, man, the first thing I'm ready to do is tee off when things are not the way I want them to be. And I have noticed that as I've been more convicted in my faith and have slowed down to actually temper myself, I'm 
Honestly, Mara, things have actually worked out better. And the people who have done the offensive have actually come back to me with an apology or at least with, um, you know, something that's more positive than just railing in anger. And it was me. I had to slow it down and had to be not so quick to speak. And definitely this next one, slow to anger. Since she <laughs> is usually the passenger when I'm driving, um, she has seen over the past eight years, that's seven years almost of marriage, and that one year, I, I can't say we were dating, but God was preparing us for uh, holy matrimony. She has seen reactions from me rolling down the window and yelling at anybody that could hear me to now I might pound the steering wheel, but nobody knows what's going on but her. I'm a work in progress. So I'm just saying, these are things that we have to learn and, and grow with. Now, I don't use profanity, none of that stuff. But, but, um, I, I got a temper. And I told her before I got married, I got a temper. Because I didn't want her to be caught off guard. But here's the thing I also want you to understand is that when we are angry, it depends on where that anger is coming from. I was talking about this anger thing, and anger can be in two different ways. Anger could be all about my selfishness, which is what I was talking about when I'm beating my, my hand on the steering wheel, when I'm rolling down the window and want to challenge somebody. That, that's, that's flesh. But there's another kind of anger, and I've actually displayed it here in this forum, and that's anger against people that knowingly, knowingly misrepresent Christ or lead people down the wrong path. And it's in that, which I would call a holy, righteous anger, that yeah, I do get angry in those ways, and I have in the past actually called out certain individuals on this platform because they know better. And because they know better, but they are just trying to get likes and subscriptions and all these things that will boost their natural popularity at the sake or, or, or forsaking people who are really out here wanting to understand the truth. You know, if I err in any way, it would be just that I don't have an understanding of a particular passage or a scripture. It's not me uh, doing incredibly wrong things that promotes my agenda above crisis. I, if, if you find me in error, I'll take the loss for the, for the, the greater good of more understanding and clarity that I do not do that again. But, but we have charlatans out there that promote all types of promiscuous living and they call it the gospel. They, they, they are motivational speakers that do not rely on the word of God. They don't even take time to rely on the word of God because they have promoted themselves as God. And that's why you find people saying, I go to so-and-so's church, or I go to uh, um, girlfriend's church. I go, they, they don't even talk about 
the building half the time, they talk about the person. I don't want y'all to go to Mac or Myers Church. This ain't Mac or Myers Church. We are just, hopefully, two faithful believers that just love sharing the word. But, but this is not something that we are doing for vain glory and to be able to just say, oh man, I got a thousand likes on YouTube. No, that's not the purpose. The purpose is, is to maybe to give you all a message that you may not be hearing in your local places of worship. One that is as true as we understand it and uh, prayerfully undefiled by wickedness. With that said, um, it tells us lastly to remember to put away all the filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. I like that implanted word, which is able to save your souls. I almost see it, like Myron, like having, uh, getting this uh, transplanted. If I wanted to make it, uh, put it in a natural sense, like somebody had to kind of cut me open and put in these words that would actually be life giving. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that for now. Uh, we thank you so much for hanging out with us. We thank you so much, Kristen, who actually suggested uh, James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. Thank you so much again for hanging out with us. Um, uh, next week, uh, I don't have my notes in front of me. I can't remember what the scripture is. But nevertheless, I need one more scripture for the last Sunday in February. I've got the first three all uh, already. I need one more. And again, it has to be from a, a different source than those who have already submitted it. But um, we're here to address any of your favorite uh, scriptures. And again, if you want to give us a reason why it's a favorite, uh, please do. Uh, with that said, God bless you and God keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on him. God bless. God bless.